he begins basically dunking on um, crowd psychologists from 200 years ago, um, a few hundred years ago, um, who, who sort of talked about crowds. And I think, I think this sort of equated to the, um, the lump and proletariat idea in Marx or Marxism. Um, the bourgeois disdain of crowds, um, you know, the, the the bourgeois philosophy, particularly of like say two hundred years ago, the, the clean, distinct, independent manner of men at the time, <clears throat> um, mm-hmm. when they spoke of populism, um, they spoke about it in in terms of. Um, its content. So if you if you had if you had like traditional political centers that had clear ideological frontiers, the left, the right, or whatever, um, and they'd be going at it. You know, that was distinguished, that was this is the way it's done, blah blah blah. Whereas populism, any populist intervention, was seen as sort of breaking these rules, like stepping on stepping on the toes of the establishment, essentially. And um they they spoke of populism in terms of ambiguity, so the content was ambiguous. Um, uh, it was painted as irrational um, and uh, lacking in understand. I don't know. Sorry, um, painted as irrational uh, and linked with um, women and drunkards. So, like, so if if say hypothetically, if if a member of of this male establishment, this this higher political uh, community was to somehow descend into a populist movement, they would be, I suppose they would be scorned. I imagine they would be scorned in terms of like an irrational hysterical woman or a drunkard um, and blamed for the dissolution of society. So bourgeois society um, saw Mob mob rule uh, would be one one way of phrasing, I suppose, as as something that really threatened not the dissolution of society in, in a total sense, but their society, uh, a real threat. Uh, so so the sort of the discourse of the time was directed at suppressing um, the legitimacy of of those elements uh, in society. Okay. Um, but Laclau to its defense, argued that it had its own rationality and that the analysis of the day um, lacked an understanding of the cultural context. Uh, He argues that it's not about the content of the politics, and we'll get into that a bit further down the line, but it's about sort of the form uh, that it takes. And um, it's a performative act rather than a, cont- a contented ideology, like rather than like a content full ideology, like higher politics. It's, it's, yeah, it's performative. It's not cognitive. Um, it's an act. It's not, it's not a theory. Um, and the importance Laclau attributes to the ambiguity of that content or lack of content um, it's uh, he attributes it, um, the ambiguity to to sort of the very possibility of constructing political meaning, um, and this is the and I don't feel like we've touched on the effective dimension enough. I think we we mentioned it, but possibly only in the art, the context of art, last chat. But actually, it sort of features a little bit more heavily with Lacklau and Mouffe. But the um, it's basically the sort of the emotional and actuating um, dimension. And I put those two things together uh, because it's not merely emotional. It's not merely just acting, but it's, it's where it's where impulse sort of manifests a blend of both acting and emotion i suppose like impulse would almost be like an unconscious action um so words evoke images 
often more important than their signification. So you can say words, you can have a cognitive ideological uh, treaty, uh, treaties, treatise, um, speech, and it's not so much the content of of the words that what they're saying, the signification, um, but it's the images that they evoke and um, the passion that it instills in people and the identification that um, that that so as the hypothetical where um, uh, like a, a political speech would sort of generate identity or identification in in whatever the movement was that was where the speech was coming from um, through the, yeah the identification would come through the the emotion the passion rather than the uh-huh. particular words and the content um, yeah so Laclau is just is just is sort of dashing the anal the, that early analysis of crowd psychology and populist movements, um, is saying it's absurd to put it on par with with ideology with um, um, with con- conceptual uh, politics. However, mm-hmm. it is the it is the sort of the emotional performative act of politics and um, it is the, is the delivery system for political meaning, basically, I, I suppose is, is what he's sort of saying there. Um, mm-hmm. and it's rhetorical. It's a rhetorical strategy. Well, I mean, okay, a populist movement isn't, is, is a material body of people, but when we're talking about populist politics, I suppose it's, um, it's about rhetoric. Um, And yeah, I already touched on the rational individual degraded as when they're becoming a part of a group um, and crowds being akin to women and drunkards blamed for a dissolution of society. So that, yeah, so here we go. So that um, that shift, there was a shift then in terms of crowd psychology um, attributed to Freud, um, a shift away from this pathological view uh, rooted in anatomy and biology towards the ambient view uh, where where it became less the view, say, that criminals uh, were, were, were born with it, um, were endemically so, uh, pathologically so, um, but, but that, that their behavior was, um, was shaped by their, by their surroundings, uh, by their conditions, um, other external factors, the, their lot in life. And okay. um, sort of... Freud saw social bonds. He framed social bonds through libidinal, the libidinal drive. Um, so say diverted sexuality manifests in identification, uh, so which is our, like our first early emotional ties with another person. So I suppose like when his argument was that when a child um, sort of instinctively, um, not necessarily sexualized, but what could be attributed to sort of sexual gratification, um, behaved in such a way with with anyone who obviously would be inappropriate but with their parents or whatever um you know there's a there's a constant relay of what's appropriate in terms of behavior and how that manifests then the the, the erosion of that the, the the tamping down of the the sort of that sexual instinct um manifests in identification so the love with a father or a mother um obviously freud was talking about the father <laughs> Um, uh, it's an emotional tie and it's identification. You identify, uh, he, he, he'll extrapolate, extrapolate that, uh, relationship to, to a group and its leader uh, and it's a love for the leader. And this is, this is the group. The group is constituted through a love for the leader. And that's the, that's how a libidinal drive sort of constitutes social bonds. Um, and, um, Okay, so the love for the leader, um, you, can, you can have, I don't know if there was ever an extreme real-life case of total group, con- a, a group totally constituted by a love for a leader. But uh, if you imagine, and I know you love your poles, uh, the other side of the, that dichotomy, that pole, is a, and I think this is like the, the, the anarchist 
uh, utopian vision of, of group behavior um, is total self-organization. Sure. Um, where, where, where a group comes to work or act like an individual. So if, if that's the two ends of the pole, um, all groups basically feature a blended, graded um, uh, portions of, of, either, of either side of this. Uh, and Blacklow argues that this brings us to Gramsci's hegemony, which combi- combines consensus and coercion. Um, yeah, so that is that is the intro that somehow spans three chapters. Um, and I think uh, I think chapter four in the book is the sort of, is the real meaty one. Uh, but before we go on to it, does is that that's clear cut? Any anything he's drawing out? Um, no, I think I think a any previous questions I might have had, I think you kind of cleared up sort of as soon as I thought them. Um, uh, the, I guess where, um, and this, this would be something I would fall short on, um, this idea of the Freudian kind of um, love for the father, um, I guess articulated through, is it, sorry, just to backtrack a little bit, was, the idea of the love for the father, obviously being a quite a, an, an essential part of the of I guess how you know a, uh, I guess uh, the drive of a sort of populist moment um, gets I, well how it gets that drive um, that that dedicated feeling. Is there anything with moving back to a, a focus on I guess the crowd how the, how the how the crowd plays part of that, that, I guess, that psychology. Um, I'm wondering, is there anything else, anything else in that? For example, I guess you, you said with the, with regards to the, the Freudian, um, the remark was, was made up by the love of the father, which I think was filtered into via the, via the crowd. Um, well, a group. Maybe I, I miss, miss an, Sorry, the group. I, th- I think no, 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 no. That was the start of the sentence. So I wasn't correcting you there. The um, he, I think his example in the book is he's talking about an army, and like okay. the, the 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 cohesiveness of a, of a of a particular troop or I don't know what the fuck size of group of men with guns. Um, the cohesiveness uh, sort of depends on the identification each soldier has with the general or the captain or the fucking sergeant, whatever, whoever the leader is. So yeah. the only um the only um not the only the the issue the I suppose you could this is Freud writing whenever he was writing, um but you would imagine that an alternative reason why people might fight and die for someone is a love for each other, a love for the group, uh, rather than a love for the leader. But uh, but I suppose Lackler, this is Lackler's point. It, it's it's always a blend uh, between those two poles, uh, the leader or the group. Um, I would imagine the nationalist motivation for fighting for one's country is again, it is the love of the leader. It's the the commander in chief that's that they're identifying with, that's motivating and driving them and making it the cohesive unit that's that is ultimately uh-huh. going to its death uh, for that leader. Um, so there's like there's certainly examples of it, but yet, but there you go. That's that's how it. That's how a crowd can constitute through a common identification. Uh, through okay. The yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. I think I think my roundabout way of trying to trying to backtrack there. I I, I semi confused myself. I think the idea was that what I was a little unclear of was how the group uh, or crowd psychology. Um, worked alongside you know i guess that that collective love for the father or the general or the the kind of um i guess the yeah as, as we said even even with regards to say nationalism in one's country and how that group all the constitution of all of those individual identifying i guess members or or partialities of like a group um uh how that how that psychology actually worked I guess with with regards to like forward uh, 
pushing like momentum forward with regards to a, a populist drive. And I think it was more just, yeah, the, the love for the father aspect of it. I could understand like how one would come to associate with or identify with say uh, a grand idea that maybe has come through in a speech or, or yeah. through media. But again, I guess how one be, joins into a group mentality uh through especially that. through that i guess was where i was a little unsure of so i think in the first instance like he like the primary reason of drawing freud in there is to just dissociate the the absurd views of groups that the earlier group psychologists would take but mm-hmm. ending then on bring the the point bring this closer to gramsci's hegemony um and applying that to <clears throat> applying that to uh, to Laclau's chains of equivalence and hegemonic struggles, um, mm. consensus and coercion uh, is the combination. So the consensus, and obviously we'll elaborate this further as we go. The consensus is where the subject positions in a movement in a populist movement um, forego their particular identity to also identify with with um with one another mm-hmm. in a horizontal chain however the libidinal mm-hmm. this libidinal point um manifests in coercion in the in the coercive aspect of hegemony which is where one uh one particular particularity uh becomes hegemonic and it's okay so obviously again it's sliding scale between these things uh, this is not necessarily to say um a populist movement uh, will have an authoritarian um a vanguard the vanguard <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> it's to say that a populist movement doesn't necessarily won't sorry always necessarily imply that there would be a, a coercive author- vanguard precisely it, yeah it, yeah it, but but to, but to answer your question it, the there there will be a, a, an authoritative, uh, centralized, not centralized in terms of organization, but a centered upon a particularity that will constitute the identities of the larger crowd. And it's mm-hmm. just, you, you take, like, you take those three no um, points, coercion, identity, and love, and you just mix them together. And that's kind of what he's talking about. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that, 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 that makes sense. Okay. Um, so for Laclau, discourse is the uh, the primary terrain of the constitution of objectivity, uh, synonymous with relation, and through which centrality of one element, which we're just talking about, among others, may be attained. So that's just um, discourse being the field, the terrain, um, objectivity being the sort of relationships between each subject position, and um, through which one becomes hegemonic among the rest. Um, for Laclau, empty signifiers and hegemony. Um, identity is constructed within the tension between differential and equivalential uh, logics. Hegemony, which is that strength centrality, is achieved when the identity is split, like I was just talking about a minute ago, between its own particularity and a more universal signification, which it comes to bear, which is to represent the larger movement. Um, in doing so, it becomes an impossible totality. So, like, um, we'll get into this more down the down the line. Um, the impossible totality is the sort of is the is the Lacanian real. Uh, the I think we touched on it last last chat where um, we talked about the the boy in his manifesto. This idea, this great idea of society, as if he could really like conceive of society. So that's the impossible mm-hmm. totality. Um, I, I, the reason it's it's impossible is because not only in our inability and incapacity to conceive of society, in our attempt to do so, we'll always exclude very real elements of that society. Um, mm-hmm. In in becoming a universal signifier, it has to empty somewhat it's ident- its original identity uh, and this is the empty signifier and um for the movement then it becomes 
the empty signifier, this particularity that rises, uh, it becomes the horizon of that movement and not the ground on which, like, I, I suppose that, I, I suppose that's the difference between the now and the future, the future and the now. Um, it becomes that which we aspire to, the movement aspires to. Which is the horizon, sorry. Yeah, just yeah, to exactly. Picture, connecting the dots. Okay. Yeah. yeah whereas, no, that, makes, that makes sense. Whereas the ground is that which you're literally acting upon, the reality you're in at, mm-hmm. at that moment. Uh, and then rhetoric. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So the people. Obviously, the people is very sort of an emotive aspect of populism. Um, mm-hmm. But it's a figurative act using... Uh, it's very cliche now, isn't it? The people. Like You, you think that and you just, it's so cheesy or whatever. But actually... Um, it or something that can stand in for it uh, now is is a, is an important thing if you if you want to push forward with a, a populist movement. Um, it's a figurative act using an existing phrase to name the unnameable, which is. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder, <laughs> naming the unnameable does that mean the um, that cheesiness? <laughs> but no, I, I don't think it does. It's, it's maybe there might be a touch of that, but. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So an existing phrase, it, it somehow. Tr- I, through this chapter, like like Laclau's at pains to sort of describe the process by which this empty signifier, this this once equal particularity subject position, comes to the fore. Um, and and it harks back to the earlier point about um, performative an act. It's not. It's, you you couldn't sit here and design. A populist movement uh, mm. by saying this will be the this will be the the particularity that will be the vanguard that will lead all the rest um, it's an organic process and it happens like I said not cognitively not consciously but through through an act through a performative mm. act that arises arouses passions emotions and therefore identifications and it's when that moment is named that's mm-hmm. when uh, that's when the unity of a group is formed or, or i mean mm-hmm. when its potential to form uh, mm-hmm. comes into being um so in diving down into the group dynamics of this populist movement. Lacklau starts talking about the units that constitute a group and he's not talking about particularities. Uh, He's not talking about political groups, pre-existing ones, smaller ones. He's not talking about individuals. He goes similar to Mouffe's internal identities, uh, multiple identities. He talks, his focus is uh, the social demand. Uh, So that social demand is the unit which groups uh, are, um, are constituted by which then amount to populist movements and um, for a populist movement um, if a group has a social demand uh, if many groups then have social demands and if they're not met they can accumulate um, where they're not met yeah 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 they, 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 they begin to form equivalences so I think if you have a rent issue and in your building and the building down the way has a water issue um they're t- they're distinct demands but if neither uh-huh. of them are met so you identify i like you identify in your daily life with this rent shit and it constitutes your identity you, you want to act on it and you'll go out there and you you'll identify <laughs> with these issues if someone else has a, a rent issue two blocks away <laughs> you'll identify with them the same goes with the water people, but you wouldn't necessarily identify with them because it's a different experience. Right. Uh, it, mm-hmm. but, but, when, but when the water people start talking about their fucking landlord and the fucking local authority not doing anything about it, all of a sudden, the unmet aspect of their demand is something you can identify with. So yeah, it can it leads it to being able to be articulated under, say, that of a... It becomes rather than a rent and or water issue, it can become a tenants issue. So exactly. Speak, or, There's yeah. a, a, an equivalence is formed. Yeah. And the more, the more that these equivalences uh, form, the wider the gap becomes mm-hmm. between the people, uh, latent, and the institutions that are not meeting their demands. And this is, this, is a, this is an internal frontier. So I think like in Hegemonian socialist strategy, 
they were the black lion move were sort of um attempted to avoid this certain frontier dynamic um because they were because they, they were trying to distinguish what they were talking about from populism however things have changed frontiers are in <laughs> and uh and that yeah they they want to constitute a people uh get get your hard line get your frontier um get your the people and uh if this um if these chains of equivalences um have any legs whatsoever uh they will eventually form a stable system of signification and that's when you uh, that's when you start your um the populist movement can sort of come into being um and the, and a stable system of signification is just the sort of the grammar that these different demands will begin to use among themselves okay so it might not even sorry go ahead go ahead well just to finish that a, th- a grammar through which they can identify with each other it's like learning a language together i suppose Okay, and even then, that that um, that grammar doesn't necessarily. Um, uh, what am I trying to say here? I guess the the grammar and the language in and of itself becomes it, it's well, it's used as a signifier in and of itself, isn't it? It's not necessarily a grammar that um, uh, describes or or is kind of a yeah. It, it's not saying this is the movement itself or the populist movement itself. It's, 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 it's an the, even, it's the form it's another of content again. Yeah. 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 I yeah. guess so that's, oh, that's yeah. perfect. Perfect point. Um, the, um, but uh, it's difficult because uh, relations and chains of equivalence, the logic of equivalence is very fragile. Um, counter hegemonic um, struggles can easily um, intervene and uh, mm-hmm. disrupt um the equivalence you, you, you know you can easily uh, i mean that's that's i suppose the uh the culture war is a constant um hegemonic struggle in articulating um different takes on political issues to uh mm. to sort of attract the identities and passions of uh particular groups of people in the society with unmet needs um Uh, and 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 that's uh, i don't think that's the full definition of logics of difference uh, uh with respect to countering logics of equivalence but both of them are incompatible but necessary to construct the social um the social being the sort of the locus of the irreducible tension between them uh, and i guess what he's sort of talking about there is just society can't just be a totality like say a, to- a totality of equivalence um mm-hmm. because there's no f- there's no capacity to move to to feel different it's impossible uh we've mm-hmm. covered this before so if 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 it's declared it's doing so at the cost of excluding people and if it's declared, it'll suppress those people, whereas a total logic of difference, a society defined by a logic of difference is just i assume just chaos uh totally atomized yeah. bouncing off the walls nothing so mm. where we come together as a society is in the tension between these two um forces in in society i guess or in humanity maybe um so we select an identity to represent the impossible in this impossible totality um I think this is really important in terms of the distinction of the other, th- at least the first two chats that we were having um, in discussing the possibility of having a universal subject. And I think, I think you actually said it in the chat with Stephen really well. Um, I think it might have been the first time it came up. Um, making a distinction between having a universal subject as the ends and a universal subject as the means of a movement um where a universal subject as an ends is like this is the this is the this is the political outcome we want we want uh, a society that is that is different to now but ultimately closed 
uh, sutured. We want to we want to get rid of now and institute a new closed system. Um, and this is what it's going to look like, which is obviously incredibly authoritarian. Um, and an impossibility. And like I said, that will lead to exclusion and therefore suppression. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The but yeah, yeah. Sorry, the adverse. The adverse to that is is a universal subject as as a means to creating a new um, a new um, society uh, is, is entirely different because there's because in in an organic network of of identifications that leads towards the the system of signification, the grammar that we're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. There, there's, there's, a, there's an energy that can be generated. I think Shizek made that point. Um, in in that identification, in discovering commonalities, in discovering that like a wider world of identification, uh, that that's that's quite energizing. Um, Mm-hmm. And, and and I suppose instills kind of a lot of hope and or can instill a lot of hope in people and go, oh, oh fuck, this is, this is something we can do. So like having a universal subject in terms of taking down the current system or society is totally different to designing the institution that arrives after that society. Um, so yeah, yeah populist one, sorry. No, 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 I was just gonna say, I guess it's just that, I guess it, it's, probably either an echo or just a compliment to the point i guess i mean within yeah within the concept of it being a a means of rather than an end an end goal i guess you um sorry i'll have to cut out the audio or my stomach is growling um <laughs> oh, okay that's good then and um, so um no i guess uh, as a means i guess to me would would also insinuate you know the process uh, a movement, a, a certain sort of forward momentum. But if you're not putting a fixed point with a set of criteria that you're working, I mean, you are working towards certain commonalities, but mm-hmm. not necessarily like a constituting, like end goal, I guess, sense of being. Um, it's it's a case of uh, like more like as we said, like in a sort of a sort of centralized establishment that you're working towards. I guess in that moving forward, I see the potential for, you know, a universal subject that also allows, um, that is, has the potential to, I guess, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess it, it has that potential that Muff was looking forward for, I guess, maybe even, I guess, with her concepts of like, you know, the, the radical invigoration of democracy, this idea that like the plurality is very, it's, it, it is important and it's, you know, we, we need not let go of that, that idea of nest uh, of, um, you know, personal difference, but it's that being able to, I guess, articulate, um, you know, as those, the, that kind of idea of a, a universal subject or in those sort of lamp ways that we explain the kind of temporal yeah. kind of comings together. So that momentum I see as being something where there is the potential for that plurality to also work within uh, the universal subject, I guess. Just because, again, I would feel that if you're moving towards something, it allows for the opposite. I would feel that uh, pockets of stagnation or fragmentation could form along the way, so to speak. This is exactly where the left is today, isn't it? I mean... Like yeah. the, it is, a, it, we are currently under a heavy, widespread negotiation regarding um, how centralized and how dispersed uh, we ought to be as a movement. Um, the autonomy of the, the, the particularities um, can, it seems, can go to the extreme of of being uh, returning organically to um to very localized uh, ghettoizations where they're just self excluding uh on on whatever very small particular identification um they they're they're possessed that's driving them 
um, mm. to to the cost of basically the political, and this is the argument, to the cost of of recognizing um, the possibility of uh, working with anyone else. It's 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 as if, and obviously we're talking about fringes here, but it it but it it's in the discourse. It it it, it is part of the conversation, but um, on these fringes, it, there there does seem to be. Um, subject positions that um, are so specialized in terms of their identity that because I suppose what constitutes that identity is an absolute um, carving away of, of everything else to, to, to sort of form to form that identity whereas I suppose you know an identity could have been formed a hundred years ago around a singular issue <laughs> like uh you know um suffragettes the, their identity was well well okay yes so we're women but as women uh we we don't have uh suffrage uh we don't have access to the franchise and we want we want that that's our demand and we identify with that and we're passionate about it and we are now a political movement for that mm. whereas i think now um there does exist the phenomenon where identities are so clean shaven um, that every single frontier possible uh, has been very clearly defined. And in, mm-hmm. it, it, if a movement, if they were to link to a, to a movement, they would have to blur the lines of that identity. And I wonder, is there an anxiety? Um, because I don't know, did we speak online or, or in person before about the sort of, how um how identity can um must be linked to sort of the death drive the uh, or not the death drive but the, like you know the the anxiety of death um to be eradicated if if this if if i if i lower my value here on this frontier in order to work with that other identity there um do i become less of myself i think that's the sort yeah. of the sort of the the, the there's like there's a hyper, a hyper dimension uh, to to sort of current identity formations, and yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, the, the, it's impossible at that level to be political because to be political, regardless of populism um, or any greater movement at all, to be political is to sort of uh, is to is to take one clear frontier <laughs> and and sort of uh, start attacking that um yeah Mm -hmm. no i mean yeah um the um so but it well bring it back to populist movement uh there is there is there does end up being something that does represent the impossible totality the thing that people will aspire to um the um populist movement aspires to replace this identity um the identity the identity of the existing representation of a totality so whatever whatever vision whatever political vision an establishment politic politics offers is the same thing it represents the impossible totality and the populist movement will seek to replace this identity seeing themselves as as the totality of the community so this is this is key for the identification of a populist movement. It's um, it externalizes the establishment. It's like if 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 so society was like an organic um, an organic entity, uh, which of course it is. But um, seeing it in its total sense, it, you know, it grows, it grows. It's sort of green, fresh. Um, molecular organization through the leadership of, of a vision let's say it's dna key or whatever um but eventually that dna becomes decrepit and st- stops serving the the greater organism uh, and that mm-hmm. org if that organism is sentient enough to be aware it will exclude that um aspect you know and we'll, we'll try to grow it out will be so it even though it is currently a totality, it sees, it, it articulates this mal element as 
external to it, even though it isn't. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, and I as and as a movement will start to try to organically push it out to exclude it uh-huh. uh, de facto, and um, and become fresh. So, so that in itself is a process of having a renewed vision of that total society. And again, of course, we can't actually envision society, so it's just rhetorical. It's just discursive. Um, but yeah, so that they'll seek to exclude that which fails to meet the demands. Uh-huh. So it always has to be an underdog populist movement it has to be a majority. There has to be a clearly defined enemy or adversary. Um, and it, uh, and, and yeah. And damn it. What was the third thing there? Whatever I just said. <laughs> um, so Lacklight points out that, um, the ontological impulses in society outlive their ontic machinations, which is to say that, um, and, and reading this, I was like, like it really hit it hit home, particularly um, with the current sort of state. It was it was around the time of the general election in the UK, and it's just like I came away from reading the section going, there was there was never a left and there was never a right. There was only, uh, I'm sure I said it to you. There's only the sort of impulse, the social impulse or the impulse of humanity to exclude others, and there, there's the politically directed. Um, articulation that draws that channels that impulse so that's the ontological impulse um Uh and the ontic the ontic is the content uh, is left or right and um so whereas the protest vote in society was once channeled by the left but because the left left the left which is should be we should have t-shirts made saying that (laughs) um it's now channeled by the right that that impulse in society so it's not like a block of leftists like born in the wool or whatever that phrase is leftists died and a new generation of rightists were born the same people with the same impulse um ended up identifying with something other but they weren't identifying with left or right they were identifying with something that channeled that impulse and that's um that's a, uh, I think that's a, a hegemonically directed. So yes, there's there's a left and a right politics that hegemonically um, struggles to articulate um, a primacy, a hegemonic situation between themselves to direct that impulse. Um, I think it's an important distinction. Uh, it's also important to identify the enemy. That's what I was saying a minute ago. I think I dropped the ball there. Identify an enemy in a total way, because if you articulate um, the identity of that which you seek to exclude as a movement, all that identity has to do is act otherwise. And then you can't, it escapes identification. So obviously this is capitalism's great um, (laughs) achievement over the last hundred years was to uh, escape the identification of Marxism as uh, something that society should seek to exclude by fully adapting and um, waging a culture war that um, identified itself, uh, identified like a range of elements in society and brought it on board. Like, oh, you want to work for home? Here's Google. Oh, you want to, you want, uh, you want Coca-Cola and three million times of cans of be- types of cans of beans. You got it. Um, um, abortion, yeah, gay marriage, um, and so on. So these these things are, you know, um, capitalism escapes identification through adapting. Uh, it'll never. And as yeah. soon as you get to the um, to its real fear, you know, I suppose it's 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 constantly concealing this fear, uh, and and once we. And I think this is the importance of a lot of sort of the academic side of things like, yeah, um, it's important to be working in the field, but also important to be sort of analyzing. This is the importance of analysis. What I'm trying to say is to, uh, is to identify that identification is to sort of get to the kernel of what it is uh, we don't want as a movement. And when I say we there, I mean any movement, what it is a movement doesn't want. Hmm. Stop me anytime.
No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I was just, uh, I think, yeah, you, we articulated in, I think, was it the last chat that we had where we, we talked a little bit about that idea of, yeah, capitalism's uh, ability to adapt. Um, the way, the kind of mental image I have in my head is, I think, yeah, because we were referring back to Fisher, weren't we? Um, this idea that capitalism essentially uh, saw that people were starting to uh, get riled up, start using anti-capitalist rhetoric. Mm. So the way I envisioned it in my, my cartoonish mind is that it opened up a kiosk where it could sell uh, stuff that people could identify with as anti-capitalists. Yes. And uh, just started sort of uh, sh- shelling, shelling out um, films, art, anything with a sort of, uh, you know, anti, well, essentially, you know, shelling out things that are, that are in content, anti-establishment. Yeah. But I guess in, in the form of how they're, how they're sold, what they represent, and essentially what they feed back into um, is, is in and of itself that, that amorphous, um, actually, I think, yeah, the way I, the, the, what was it we said before? The, the cement between the pebble dash. I can't remember how we described it. Yeah. <laughs> or something along those lines. You'd have it's to. Just, it's it would just, take it another literally... millennium. It was, it was that yeah. moment that, that made sense yeah. in that moment alone. That was a yeah, beautiful that, moment. Yeah, that kind of, that polyfiller uh, effect that it just gets into every nook and cranny. Um, so therefore you can't, you know, you can't see the, uh, was it the forest for the trees or, or whatever the saying is, it's like, it's just, it blends in. Um, but yeah, sorry, that was merely, merely to compliment what you were saying. People, people get to that core, that actual, that kernel, uh, and like possibly more virulently, more, um, like in an imminent, more imminently rather than, you know, in a wide, uh, theoretical um it it exists i'll get i'll get to that second but once mm. people do come close to it like the it, capital is violently repressive you, you, just, get, you that, just get shot like <laughs> yeah i mean i think it, it in, a, in a way as well i mean you know ways it might even uh it, it may even feed back into into the point you had earlier on about this idea of like to to allow ones and again i'm going to use a, a cartoonish um visualization because it just it came to me while you were saying it this this idea of identity um and and being so um you know um umbilically connected to this sense of identity that to sever it um by sorry the the concept of severing it um as in opening yourself up to perhaps you know being able to associate that with other other struggles other other demographics other subject positions and the way i kind of see it is like stopping yourself from being a, a, a an island with a sandy beach that the tide the tide can reach and rather just you know putting up uh, those concrete blocks you see on harbors yeah. all the way around and it's merely something that everything will always be smashing against um essentially reinforcing you know yeah. your identity to say but but that 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 fear that anxiety we were kind of proposing that might exist around the possible severing of that, which again you know it says it, yeah it's it's an existential crisis for some people I can imagine, uh, or I can I can totally understand that being mm-hmm. a thing because it it screams out illegitimacy. How are you seen in the eyes of your peers? All that kind of stuff. Um, the the idea that within the I guess going back to what we were saying in the previous chat as well this idea of like could you know uh you know i i can't remember if it was specific to the idea of a, an art critique movement but i think maybe it was my misunderstanding of what you were saying with regards to um you know was fisher's uh pulling out of this idea of like all this kind of like anti-capitalist uh art and media being generated by capitalism um you know that i can only imagine is a also in itself like an existential crisis that you can either confront or not say for example yeah. in the art sector itself you can have artists whose work um is uh anti-establishment so to speak and and do speak out about various uh let's say inequalities within those systems but it's all done 
under the system that it's created in and your i guess you i guess in one way you can only have more or less of a hand in how it's done like if you kind of allow yourself to be kind of your your program i suppose to be orchestrated by a much larger part of an industry so yeah. much like let's say like the 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 input that a solo artist has on how all that content is created and promoted and the bigger effects and wider effects of um, what's happening there to create that perhaps one edgy song? Um, or do you go full the other direction, which is, you know, very much you, you take full control of that and then you also risk the uh, creature comforts that you get from perhaps make, making it, so to speak. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. yeah, I mean, I can imagine, yeah, the same with any sort of uh, art I guess, or creatives, uh, industry-based creatives. It's an existential, it could also, I guess, propose, I'm proposing the same existential crisis people have with identity. They begin to identify with this idea of, no, 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 I, but I make, I make art that, that sing, I sing about the institutionalized capitalism that we all, we all live under. It's like, um, and, and who's letting you do it, Yeah, I guess. And if you start to figure that out, can you walk away from it? Yeah. Um, I wonder. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that was more, more of a tangent, I guess. Not at all. Come on. <laughs> on that point. All, all we do is tangents. <laughs> um, it's, the co- it's the conversations we have in between that are <laughs> interesting. It's, it's the uh, stones and the pebble dash. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's the cement. Oh, I can never tell. The <laughs> Yeah. Like again, it's it. This is this is the sort of struggle that we're we're faced with again. It's a, it's the same story, isn't it? Um, well, although the, it's just it's that more specific uh, focus that you're talking about there. Um, oh. Like I definitely, I definitely like this the sort of the traditional selling out thing. I definitely sort of feel less uh, like the, the the parameters for what that means is it, far narrower than it used to be for me. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, any band that that took a dollar <laughs> back in back oh, in the day. I see. Were, you mean in how you mean in how you analyze out. it? The band the band has has narrowed. Not yeah, like well, as in naturally it's narrowed. It's it's more like the the band on how it's analyzed. How you analyze it is not not the band. The 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 sort of their behavior. Like the uh, I'm far more forgiving uh, now. The, the the system's the system. It's like what can you do about it? when you're producing mm. art if you know what i mean or when you're making a living yeah. um sure. of of course there's there is like there is radical art <clears throat> out there i'm sure i think that i mean what move was talking about um you know art for the sake of revealing um the situation we're in you know that's that's oh, fantastic nice. but also in terms of the everyday <laughs> people like we i don't know if black law will but Zizek certainly will argue that we're in it we're in a total system and um there's no point in merely being transgressive and defaulting the inherent power that the system does afford you at any given moment if if sure. any at all um but if any at all what i mean there is to be able to make a living or write a song and make a living, whether you're whether you're baking, serving coffee, or or selling records. Like, uh, I I mean, I'm sure there's been cases where people thought they were being radical while selling, uh, selling records. But I'm sure the vast vast majority of any radical artists who were selling their work felt more that they were expressing the situation. And maintaining mm-hmm. sort of a healthy, uh, a healthy uh, sort of mentality, or by by expressing that um, poison. But I, I mean, at the same, or toxin. At the same time, of course, they they ingest it back again. But like, they, but but they know that they're aware of it. They, there's not very much they could do about it. I mean, like, it's systemic. It, it you you have to wait for a for a populist movement. You can't just generate these things. And I don't mean that in a stagist way. You can agitate. Uh, you can work towards and you can organize um, and you can articulate um, and you can engage the discourse. Uh, and uh, and if like selling records while engaging the discourse is engaging the discourse, 
and maintaining your actual biological existence. So, hmm. You know, um, the, there's definitely a threshold then where you co-opt something and exploit something to make a book. When you're not, when you're not, um, when you're when you're pretending to be, when when if there was a a, a punk folk movement that was expressing themselves and and gathering groups and entertaining activists whatever i'm sure quickly following that there were uh boy bands doing the exact same sort of style and that's that's a sort of an exploitation and it's not even an exploitation of the people in the bands it's an exploitation by the actual record companies making a book on something that was trendy uh while while the boy band members aren't necessarily expressing something they're just making a book like some sure, they're more they're, yeah, they're reflecting rather than expressing. I guess, <laughs> yeah, inflecting, like, inflecting. No, 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 I and I I agree, and I think I think I you know I do, I guess yeah, I wouldn't want the my commentary earlier on. I guess not, and not necessarily between the two of us because I think we 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 already know what each other think because <laughs> we talk the whole time. But um, yeah, no, I think you know it. I think maybe I can't remember if it, one of the earlier videos we did i think we definitely talked a little bit about um you this exact sentiment and like around youtube and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know can you can you uh you know what wh- where i guess does being um anti-establishment in your content on youtube while relying on while while choosing i guess yeah that was it. It, was, it was more about the idea of is it a choice to put stuff out through youtube or is it merely the means of being able to make your your living within this i guess that system that we're yeah. you know the system that we're talking about the system is the system you know not everyone is just gonna go suddenly off onto i don't know some some new streaming site that's run completely on decentralized i don't know tokens and you know can just you know be doing everything in a completely blockchainy open democratic you know, democratized way, they can agitate towards it. But right now, if they're able to make, you know, a living, a working living doing what they're doing via, and that's the only game in town, then, you know, it's exclusionary, exclusionary, I don't know, it it would exclude, yeah, exclusionary to, to say, exclusionary, pardon, to turn around and say, um, you know, you're not you're you're not doing it right. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gatekeeping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is viral, isn't it? Like COVID. Yeah. The term gatekeeping. Um, mm. it, yeah. So further along here, um, mm-hmm. Zizek brings up. I think it was Zizek. Um, doesn't sound like a lack in my head. Uh, the distinction between. The symbolic, the Lacanian symbolic, the real, and the fuck. The symbolic, the real, and the motherfucker. Hang on. <laughs> the symbolic, the real, and the imaginary. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, it's my favorite part of that, tri- that triad. <laughs> um, it's my least, but uh, yeah. well, for for it's for what he links it to. Um, so oh the, no! Of course, no. I just mean my personal favorite uh, okay. has nothing to do with Lacan. <laughs> oh, what Zizek linked it to? Um, but, oh, okay. So yesterday uh, on our Twitter, uh, I retweeted a um, a retweet from Michael Brooks uh, about a video of a guy over there. I'm guessing maybe sort of union activist. I can't remember. He had like a two part video. Uh, but what I retweeted was someone had done a sum, like a 13 to 15 tweet sum of the video because uh, I couldn't listen to the video at the time. And um, and I, I thought it was spot on, but basically it was... it was um, So the imaginary is the is the sort of sub-middle class, the, 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 the faux middle class, the, the, the sort of the, the secure, happy working people. Uh, of our society, not not merely in any terms of being wealthy, but they they, they but they, they can be quite conservative, of course, because they have some amount of security, uh, and oh. um, and and what they have, they hold. Attitude can pervade that um, layer of society, 
and the the real uh, Zizek links to the um, the very the the destitute uh, because they are literally they they don't have the privilege uh, to imagine what society is to delude themselves that it is otherwise because they are at the coal face of it they are at the brunt they are they are experiencing the real of our society um every day and struggling with that and then there's the symbolic which is this uh, sort of liberal elite the symbologists the academics the 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 lawyers anyone anyone i suppose with an education that applies it to to leftism um mm-hmm. but so this this guy was making the point that it, in the retweet that this this symbolic layer of the left um is is also there's a conservatism or at least a lack of urgency because because through their um through their cultural capital they're able to make a living so and Zizek, uh, sort of um gives out about that back in the 80s with the uh, the the sort of left academics at the time that they're, they're sort of comfortable enough so they're not really engaging real radical critical um critically radical um uh theory and um on the 13th or 14th tweet of this sum and i don't know how ironic it was presented in the video but uh you know the whole the whole thing going we need to get rid of this this cottage industry of the left we need to get rid of this sort of professional activism we need to get rid of this symbolic um liberal elite style side of the left uh, mm-hmm. but the first thing you can do is donate to our magazine i was just like are you fucking joking <laughs> i'm sh- wow. like yeah i mean may- oh, yeah, maybe maybe this magazine is is super radical uh it is is really bringing people together it is like starting a, like a real movement and, and br- draw like amplifying the voice of the excluded the real but uh just the irony in how that was presented. Uh, yeah, like I said, it might be totally different in the video, but in these tweets, it was just like, you know, the guy who wrote this sum, you know, could have actually, instead of been supporting it, might have actually been undermining the video by presenting it in this way. It's like, come on. But yeah, yeah so, no. so that, that's the, to me, the reason I brought it up is it's the inescapability of, of the situation. Right, okay. Uh, link between movements can possess its own consistency reacting over them this must become their ground constituted by the individual demands and a common denominator ah we're so far from the trunk here i have fucking no idea what that means um there's a there's a consistency in the relationship between the um the constitutive parts the the equivalent uh moments of the chain um it the relationship between them um like I said, it, ha- it can have its own consistency uh, and interacts. It's, it's, it, if, if you join a chain of equivalents, you, you, it, it changes you, um, basically. You don't, you don't just sign up and it's clean cut. You insert and you outsert if you so wish. It, I guess the, the, the point about changing the identity because you come to identify with this wider movement, with a, with a hegemonic uh, central particularity, um, hmm. But where he says this must become their ground, I'm not entirely clear on. Uh, like, I suppose the daily reality that they must perform this new identity. I guess um, if okay. if it is to be and, a successful populist movement, go on. I'm just. I mean, is it is it to they must perform that new identity, or is it the performance the of both. the consistent like being open to that new i those new identities or that Ooh. that soft sense of identity i'm just wondering if it's like a consistent opening of uh because then i guess that allows you to continue i guess exactly the 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 chain of equivalences and also then chains to form in directions that weren't even can uh, like i guess conceived preconceived un, un, yeah preconceived or unforeseen links of equivalence maybe it, it's it's an open performance. I don't know. I'm just, just throwing it out. No, I, I think, uh, I mean, like I think in the book, it's simply put as uh, the, the, this, um, the ground, the reality it, it is constituted by the original identity, but also the, um, the, the, the sort of new identity, the common denominator, the equivalence between them. 
Uh, so okay, yeah. I, I suppose the performance is a constant negotiation of the of being a part of that chain in terms of both those things, mm. which absolutely includes what you're talking about. Um, the um, because sort of um, well, that comes later. I'll get to that in a second. I'll qualify that further in a minute. Um, so that's yeah, that's the split identity. The hegemon in the chain of equivalence uh, is still itself. So we've covered this already. Um, that but it's also that which represents the chain whose constitutive, constitutive identities are also split, which is just exactly what we're talking about, uh, still the selves, but also inscribed within the chain. Yeah, so that, that performative negotiation is, is what he's getting at there. The larger the chain, I think you've covered this, um, the less attached the signifier is. Oh, it's actually, I think in the book, I don't have it down here, but I think in the book uh, it also says, and this is what you touched on, the larger the chain, the more difficult it is to, uh, to sort of to keep it together. But here he's saying... Um, the less attached the the signifier is the uh, to its original demand, so um, it, it's becoming more empty. The hegemon is becoming more empty of its original identity, and I think we, I think we touched on that uh, in a previous uh, chat. Um, I made the point that with the far right, the signifier is probably quite a hell of a lot more empty in relation to a democratic or left signifier. Um, I would imagine that um, so make America great again is the thing that Stephen was talking about how empty Trump is and the signifier that he employs to constitute his populist movement. Um, mm-hmm. It's a flow. It's so empty. It's floating. He, he'll change the uh, he'll change the signification to suit on a constant basis. Whereas I think um, I think that just won't wash in in a left populism. I think the um, the signifier will have to have. Uh, a far higher degree of integrity in terms of its um in terms of its original ideals uh it'll still have to become empty to a degree but uh, far less so than i think uh, on a right populism and i think actually that's the key ultimately i mean i've not necessarily to base that on this on but i think that's the key going forward in terms of ultimately succeeding in a hegemonic struggle struggle with the far right is that um the integrity of our demands are far more organic, um, far more in the real, facing the real. Um, uh, the the agenda is set by that base. You know, it's not um, it's not set by an alternative agenda and just spinning rhetoric. There's a substance to uh-huh. it, and I think that'll uh, overcome, I suppose, um, ultimately. It, 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 the the only re- go on. I was just going to say, do you think that it's the uh, the the sort of like urgent impulse on the left to uh, we 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 always need to have uh, rather than make a fleeting statement the way that you might see on the far right, um, yeah. we we on the left are preconditioned to need A, B, and C examples after making a fleeting yeah. comment. <laughs> Ring your fingers. Saying, yeah, saying to Anna the other day, this is why I would make a terrible fascist because I, <laughs> I I'm, I'm unable, I'm absolutely unable to make fleeting statements and then sit back and like just have everyone accept it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I always, I always have a series of like worrisome like uh, historical facts uh, to back up what I just said. Yep. Ha, ha, um, we'll, we'll be hand wringing to the, to the uh, the cows come home to the communal. Fuck, what are they called? Cantons. Um, but you know, yeah, they're, no, they're the I, communities. I, the fields of the cantons, goddamn, I don't know the name for them. Anyway, sorry, go on. But yeah, no, I think it's just to, yeah, just to compliment the, the point you were making, I guess, yeah, with, with regards to something like, as you said, uh, Make the America Great Again, does, it's, well, as you, uh, you know, it's, it's, I guess, part of that, that whole, it, it, it stems from that same, I guess, like, ephemeral um kind of oozing uh systemic uh shit that we've talked about before that kind of gets in between cracks it, it can mold its way anywhere whereas yeah with the left we would have not necessarily a more rigid take i guess but as you said just something a bit more yeah like it's just a bit more substantial um in a lot of ways the, I mean, re- returning to Stephen's point from that chat, actually, the um, the point I was trying to make to him was that, um, and actually, I guess this is point back to me anyway, but 
the left has or the right has proved that um populist signifiers are effective uh, mm-hmm. and i i just believe that the only barrier to it isn't actually the the, the rigidity but the, the just the lack of sort of exposure or ability to expose um we're just a little bit not only are we a little bit behind on articulating um a suite of uh accumulative demands um but you know i mean i think couched in the context of the fall of the berlin wall and the reeling of the uh, of the left since then I, we we are we are sort of catching we are we're cottoning on i think there was was there a period of like like just i mean there's always been infighting on the left and mm-hmm. i just feel that that tendency to infight um really held us back from regrouping in in the in the couple of decades there since the fall of the berlin wall but i do think that we are sort of coming towards articulating our response to those accumulated demands that the real have and and in the space in that time it took for us like to fail to to sort of really regroup and articulate that as as a sort of a a populist movement the right stole the march they managed to um declare that that they managed to identify that suite of our of of uh, accumulated demands and offer a solution but Mm. but a bogus one um so yeah no i do think we are hurtling towards uh towards sort of representing the left once again as something that will address those demands and once we do i do think that um that those identifications will will switch um the larger the chain the less attached the signifier was that what i was covering there yeah yeah so yeah. it doesn't need a so like i think um Lacklau sort of there's this sort of more to his point that he sort of is attempting uh, to to really sort of hammer across there it, it doesn't need a positive content um it's it's emptiness is radically invested in so i don't think that touches on the substance that i'm talking about there it's just like sometimes when people would imagine an empty signifier they'll imagine a lack something that's actually there but it is negative or um, an inverse of what you'd expect to be there if you know what i mean but he's saying uh-huh. no 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 it's 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 an emptiness that's um invested in and i guess that kind of almost means in terms of faith that if there's nothing that you're invested in that 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 i suppose that takes faith faith i guess uh yeah yeah not an abstract common feature but a performative operation um and this is and he returns to the start of the book this is the this is the function of ambiguity this is the function of vagueness this is this is what facilitates the the construction of political meaning um this is why the sort of bourgeois arrogance of those early analysts, um, why they were so off the point in in their treatment of populism was based on fear and disdain or disdain rooted in fear. Um, they they missed this point, the the the, the real effect of the vagueness of populism. Uh, it's not it's not primitive uh, as opposed to their sophisticated politics, <clears throat> but it's it is the nature of the polo- of the political. So yeah, when the uh, the name becomes the ground of the thing, the ground which I was describing above, and the name which I was describing in a different point, once it arises, it becomes irresistible to other unfulfilled demands for their radical investment in identifying with that name. It won't have control over what inscribes itself within the chain. Um, so I think this this brings us back to the there is no left and right, or there is on the political level, but in terms of actual movements and people behind that constitute that movement they're not identifying with the left or the right they're identifying with something that's speaking for them that's speaking for their unmet demands and that's what it means there if if something comes along that's anti-establishment essentially then they'll get behind it and it becomes irresistible right okay okay um hegemonic movements become nodal points in this way uh, for consolidating further identities i think that I think that this idea of nodal points, I think that's across time and space. Like you can appeal to something that happened in history 
as something that you can r rally identities around or you can or you can appeal to something either near or far to you in terms of like this is what we should be doing look at that so it's it's not in terms uh -huh. of pro it's not in terms of proximity of now here and now it could be in the past and it could be further away but nodal points were like like it, again in the war of position <clears throat> they're things that, that can inspire you to sort of get get behind i guess okay yeah yeah i get you i get you like uh i guess you can well no i was going to say maybe is it like a yeah a setting of a setting of uh i, I was gonna actually make some kind of remark about a setting of um like plateaus you would reach um but then that starts, I feel like that starts to go down the sort of like historical treatment of <laughs> Marxism, <laughs> which uh, I don't know in that. I'm just thinking it's a weak, a weak analogy. No, no, I, th I think it's actually useful. The, um, like, the Zapatistas, um, they, they struggled in a local sense and they attained their, um, they attained uh, somewhat their aims <clears throat> and they've got their autonomous space and that that's a plateau but it's also a nodal point i, I think that like if that's what you meant by plateau there uh it's 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 rapid incline in terms of struggle and its attainment and it, i suppose it doesn't have to attain anything to still be a nodal point but absolutely a plateau mm. is still um still something that can inspire uh, others to sort of to act mm. i guess i guess yeah the if you know, to further, put, like, to, to try and bludgeon the analogy into some kind of, uh, yeah, like, the, in, in, into the point I was trying to make. Because I guess, yeah, the, the concept of a plateau is not the concept of, a, is not this to, equated with that of the summit. The plateau is a point you reach. So, like you were saying, this idea that, you know, the Zapatistas can reach uh, a point where, yes, they, they have this autonomous space, but that doesn't mean that they, if, um, you know, uh for i mean you know for all uh, i guess for the foreseeable future it doesn't mean that they can't work past that to yeah, something else it's not to say that the autonomous space so yeah the, the plateau is not the summit so to speak yeah. the summit may never never actually even need to come that's what i meant by like to... they somewhat attain their aims so yeah it's it's a, it, it's it can be an inspiration that plateau as you said um, so yeah, like, sorry, I, I don't think I, I went off a bit half cocked there, but then actually it still made sense. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, um, any social whole results from an indiso indissociable articulation between signifying and effective dimensions We've touched on the effective already, uh, affect allows the signification to happen. We've touched this, the emotional identification, not rational investment affect is the essence of enjoyment in our pursuit of mythical fullness, satisfaction, object pay. Yeah. He talks about tits and milk, <laughs> uh, a lot there. Uh, it's all Lacan and Freud. Um, I feel this is this has been horrendous, like digging into this stuff because I spent so many of my younger years reading Jung, and now it turns out I'm reading a ton of Freud. So yeah, there you go. He, oh, I don't. Somewhere he gives out that uh, Zizek is actually Jungian, not Freudian. All right. Okay. Um, so you be careful. <laughs> the. Yeah, it's a, it's a pursuit of mythical, mythical fullness and satisfaction. So I, th I think he's just, um, it's an analogy that he's using from Lacan about um, the object petit a being, um, sorry if I butchered that, being like this, um, this denied thing from our youth, uh, the breast, determines our sort of pursuit of enjoyment and fulfillment. We're always seeking that mythical sense of course always um uh post hoc like always sort of looking back it's never the thing that it was um and therefore becomes mythic quite quickly but mm -hmm. still still powerful enough to drive us and uh he basically sort of uses that as an analogy to to talk about what drives us politically, I guess, what drives us in terms of identity. I don't know, This it, it must link with the identity, the libidinal drive for, with, with Freud there as well. Um, but that is, uh, let's move on. In sum, 
No social fullness is achievable except through hegemony. Hegemony is nothing more than the investment in partial object of a fullness which evades us. So I suppose it's, yeah, it's the object petty as also the, the impossible real. Uh, there is no populism without effective investment in partial object. So I think that's just, that's just a sum of, of what we just went through there. Um, the signifier must become detached from the signified, which is, we already covered. Its centrality is akin to the reproduction of unsatisfiable desire in partial objects. So he's just explaining why he's talking about tits and milk. Populism can be inscribed on any social surface. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's this is the final part for chapter four, but it's important. Um, and we did touch on it already. Um, it's form, not the content that is important as long as that surface is anti-establishment. So yeah, it can be inscribed on any social surface as long as it's anti-establishment. Uh, and like I said, it's the form, not the content that's important. So yeah. I mean, we've, we've been um, chatting as we went along. I, mean, like, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, we, 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 I think we tackled most, most of the, well, no, all the points uh, as we, as we went. So yeah, no, I think we can move on. Right. Um, swiftly with the, the rest of the book, then it's much like the, the start of the book uh, antagonisms, not inherent. Oh, so this is, uh, this is something important to the um, treatment of Zizek later. Antagonisms, are not inherent to capitalist relations of production. Uh, logical identity is required also. Uh, we'll, we'll elaborate that later. Democracy mm -hmm. came of identifying the power of the king as void. So this is the emptiness thing again. Um, hegemonic struggle is the grading of emptiness in the place of power, uh, requiring a symbolic framework to identify that place. Agonism, moves agonism, insinuates democratic identity as popular identity. Um, eventually the construction of the people is therefore essential to or for democracy all of which requires the production of emptiness the hegemonic force that seeks to occupy that place is too empty the particularity does not come to occupy the place of power democracy depends on the constitution of the people as it is through the horizontal articulation of equivalential demands that a hegemonic signifier is induced constituting the people as that which occupies the place of power, maintaining an emptiness. So this is this is an important point. Uh, it basically that was just chapter six in a, in some. Uh, it's an important point because it says that populism is essential for democracy. And of course, in the last 10, 20, 30 years, all we've heard is that populism is antithetical to democracy. Now, of course, when we're told that whoever's articulating that point does not mean democracy. They're the same sort of people that equates democracy with capitalism. They are not talking about democracy. They are robbing you of democracy. So here's a technical outline of why populism is essential to democracy. So this idea of emptiness, the, so when it was, it wasn't, it wasn't the, executing the king and leaving the throne as empty that allowed democracy to sit on the throne it was the discursive sort of realization or awakening that the power of the king wasn't legitimate so mm -hmm. that power the place of power the throne uh, uh not hypothetically uh, metaphorically became empty uh, through through a, a matter of perception, looking at the king and all of a sudden realizing, hang on the fuck on, get the fuck off. Um, mm. So in, in, a, in a hegemonic struggle, um, a democratic one, uh, the, the hegemonic placeholder, the, the empty signifier, it's not to, to arrive that particularity to the throne uh, so that it occupies the place of power, but it is to it is to uh, it is to deliver it to the throne, uh, but not, but not to occupy it. I, I have said two different things there. Um, so because it's an empty signifier, you're putting it in place of power, but the particularity does not re-inject itself into its identity. 
Does that make sense? Sure. So is it that, yeah, I, I, is it to maintain, I guess, I was going to say, is it to, I guess, or is this maybe to have assumed that if a, let's say a counter hegemonic movement was in this, in this, you know, in this idea that moving towards the throne, um, this is an idea, I guess, to say this is under the assumption that something has ascended the throne, which um, this, this, you know, I guess, yeah, hegemonic popular movement has said, um, you know, an antagonism, I guess, has, has formed here. And the movement towards the throne is, as you said, not to reinstate that, that hegemonic um, articulation as on the throne, but rather to re-centralize the, the, the nothing, the, the emptiness, I yeah. guess. It's, it's to alleviate, or, or sorry, no, to reinstate that no, um, no side or no end of the pole yeah. Um, has a, a position of privilege. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. No, that's that perfect. The, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, It's it's to it it because because it was so. Imagine if it was the um, imagine if it was the the tenancy union that we were hypothetically talking about earlier. No, we weren't. Uh-huh. We were literally talking about it, but hypothetically earlier, and um, the it was the rent issue guys that um managed to be the vanguard um it's not so everyone the water and the electricity and the interior decorating and um all of those other issues it's not as if they want to get behind the rent people so that they oust the local councillor or the landlord and become the land- landlord or councillor so that they make sure that rent is always the top situation that is dealt with and all the other oh. issues fall to the wayside. It's the empty signif- signifier dimension that is to be put in place there, the vision of the new society that everyone identified with. So remember that aspect of it, This, the, it's a vision of a new totality that's being represented it's not the it's not a particular identity it's just that that particular identity has come to somehow represent that wider vision so it's putting in that wider vision into that place um in in a radical way uh, it is to put that representative particularity into the place of the councillor or the landlord um so that it is totally empty always as you, as you just said and that that all the other issues hegemonically so like there's the there's the king see there's the throne everything else circulates in terms of importance below it as issues arrive arise uh-huh. uh, and uh, through through their own hegemonic struggles uh, as long as nothing gets into that spot then these will always negotiate among themselves as equals in terms of what happens but if someone sure. sits in that spot if the renter dude gets to that spot then all of a sudden he has the power to lock an order in where uh to institute if it so wishes a hierarchy of uh needs um through all those other people yeah no and i think yeah we i mean it's it's very in line with everything that we've been i guess working through with with the previous previous chats and previous videos we've been, you know discussing you know the I guess uh, you know, with with Muff and the Klaus previous books, this um, this idea of returning to point. Cool. Um, so yeah, I guess um, w- with regards to the the kind of I guess the maintenance of this of this uh, this emptiness. Um, I guess I'm associating it with everything. I mean, going all the way back to some of our early, early, early chats on um, Maclau and Mouffe, um, this idea that, I guess I would akin it with the, uh, I think the unpublished that, chats. I can't remember if it was their words or ours, but this idea of, um, with their return to this kind of idea of like radically <clears throat> reinvigorating politics, it was like the idea of the game. Um, and if one were to kind of, I guess, enter enter into the game and, 
i.e. in this in this situation would be enter into the game, let's say, fascism, and just sort of, you know, ascend the throne. Um, the idea is that uh, obviously the counter hegemonic movement would then seek to kind of reinstate that emptiness on the throne um, because that emptiness, that, that space um, is the potential for that, that reinvigorated political discursive that would, I guess is, you know, what I'm saying, the idea that it's that, that, that constant space of non privilege or equal, equal footing um, for both sides of a discursive, uh, both sides of a democratic discursive. Um, and that's that, that is that potential, that space, that emptiness is the potential for that to actually continue being like, and, and, and to be something that's positively charged yeah. by the agreement <clears throat> that nobody, within the game. yeah, within the game, ascends this, um, ascends the throne Absolutely. forcefully, forcefully. Yeah. Um, and and to return to that because I I do think it was in the unpublished unpublished chats on hegemonian social strategy um, mm-hmm. that uh, what has happened in the post war period where <clears throat> an agreement um, between the democratic elements of our society and the liberal elements of society after defeating the fascist elements of our society um, I think the agreement was to rest upon each other in that way now this is a dyadic rather than totally flux and circular but it, we're talking about such a huge institution of the west um that that that, that that's fine and um, so they they resting against each other keeping each other in check from from taking that mantle and what you see with reagan and thatcher is the liberal element declaring um real reality <laughs> is is mm. is over determining our society is 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 going against that agreement and um and taking the throne and uh what you've seen because of that um the left had very little choice but acquiesce you could argue <laughs> um for whatever reasons uh and um because that tension, that dynamic, that static dynamic, um, dynamic in the tension, in the micro tension between the democratic and the liberal elements of society, in not arriving at that throne, in not becoming a hegemonic, um, um, a hegemon, that tension releasing has allowed the fascist element of our society to creep back in. Um, you let that slide and this tension becomes lax and whatever happens in that void in the the lack of energy that the tension provides fascism steps in has stepped in and has determined and has gotten once again close to getting closer to that throne themselves and um yeah well jesus come on we're in we're in a situation where we're looking down this the same barrel of the gun we were a hundred years ago. Hmm. Um, to quickly conclude, and I know we've had a couple of breaks, but it's been two hours. <coughs> um, there, w- there was a couple of other chapters there. There's the chapter eight, the final chapter is actually quite interesting because it raises three questions by looking at past populists. Like I think Stephen says this, you know, this work isn't really based on historic examples or whatever, but uh, chapter eight, looks at three historic examples of populism and um, raises three interesting uh, questions, but I, I, we're just going to skip past that and race towards the Zizek thing and end with that, mm-hmm. which happened last time as well, <laughs> except this will be a bit more comprehensive. So in the conclusion, he uh, gives a short treatment on uh, Zizek and their argument. Um, like I said, I think it's like seven, six or seven years since the, they had a, they had a full on, um, argument in the book which of course I can't remember the name of um, <clears throat> something hegemony and universal something or other um, this, is, this is after that but I suppose we're going to start with that which isn't ideal that's all I'm getting at but however
Here we go. Zizek argues that class overdetermines the horizon of other particularities. This contamination, he says, of the universal by the particular is stronger than the struggle for hegemony. It structures the very terrain on which the multitude of particular contexts fight for hegemony. So he's just saying that capitalism is the context and is not a hegemonic determination, I think, pretty much along those lines. Um, okay. Overdetermining the horizon. I suppose Laclau would argue that you can't overdetermine the horizon. But I mean, I suppose discursively you can. Um, Laclau responds, capitalist domination is not self-determined, uh, derivable from its own form, but the result of a hegemonic construction so that it... it that its centrality derives, like anything else in society, from an overdetermination of heterogeneous elements. Um, I think he's saying there that um, you know it's, it's articulations, the importance of the importance of. I mean, earlier on in the book, he, he's talking about the identity needed to to cause the awareness that the relations of production are unjust or contradictory or whatever way any various socialist wants to describe them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll read through it and get to the, get to the discussion in the uh, looking at the other book. Um, resistance against capitalism would be useless. Uh, Laclau was saying resistance. Laclau was arguing that under Zizek's terms, resistance against capitalism would be useless until its logic developed internal contradictions. I thought I'd had. Nobody, Laclau claims, doubts the centrality of economic processes to capitalist societies. It becomes an issue, though, when Zizek transforms the economy into a self defined homogenous instance of operating. Oh, sorry, homogenous instance operating as the ground of society. So this is economy as base, the economic okay. base. <clears throat> but like yeah. everything else, the economy is a locus of overdetermination of social logics, which is the hegemonic articulation its centrality is the result of the obvious fact that the material reproduction of society has more repercussions for social processes than do other instances discuss it as we go uh, or later uh -huh. the problem with this centrality then of a pure anti-capitalist role is that we don't know what that struggle is or looks like so one of the ongoing things that he uh, gives out about Zizek is that well what what does he mean by anti-capitalism what does he mean about what does that look like? What should it look like, etc. cetera? 